There it is. Very good. So I'm going to take, uh, talk about a practical CRS mod security setup. Before we dive into that, who am I? That's the boring bio. Christian Follini. I'm the second author of the Mod Security Handbook. Second author, that means I wrote the second edition of the Mod Security Handbook. Mod Security is the engine. On top of it, you need the rules, and that's a separate project. That's the NOAA's project. That's why we're here. That's the OWAS core rule set, short CRS project. And I'm co-leading the project, have been co-leading it for a couple of years. Um, I could talk, dia, dive immediately down to the rabbit hole, but we'll probably leave a few people uh, behind. I need to let set the base first. And I wrapped up this talk uh, in a story about a high security setup. I've been working for a couple of years. Because 50 minutes is a long, long time, and I don't want anybody to fall asleep. <laughs> so what I'm going to wrap this into, this is about online voting. It's a high security online voting setup. Now, I take it people in the room have a certain opinion of online voting, <laughs> uh, especially in the light of the last US elections, more elections going on around the globe, but we'll see how more security can contribute here, if it should contribute at all, probably. So this is the wrapping story around my talk. And then in the central parts, we're talking about web application files, mod security, CRS, how this works, how to do this in a practical way, what rule set, and how to tweak the rule set so it's going to work out nicely, especially aimed as a high security setup. And if you manage the high security setup, it's actually easier to work on a low security, I guess then they make sense. So uh, online voting is obviously an extremely stupid idea. Uh, why do we do this? Why do we have to do this? Um, it's because Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland, just to make this uh, clear, uh, it's probably a wee bit offensive. Not explain this for you, but for the other people in the room. <laughs> so where is Switzerland? We're the, the small country in the central, Euro in the center of Europe. We're not Sweden. So we have the cheese and the chocolate. They have the Vikings and the elks, not the moose. For the country. these are elks. So this is Switzerland. And we're a direct democracy. What does a direct democracy mean? We're constantly voting. So we're not only electing parliament, we're also doing referendums. And uh, I take it, uh, California has referendums as well, but you pile them up for, do them together with elections every couple of years, don't you? We're voting constantly. In three weeks time, we're going to vote about stricter regulation, prosecution uh, of hate crimes against sexual minorities. That's the next vote coming up in three weeks. And then in May, the next one, and it goes on. We're voting like four to eight times a year. So this is a constant process. We're always in voting mood. There's always discourse going on. And this better scale. That is one of the reasons why people are thinking about online voting. And that's why we introduced voting by mail 30 years ago. So 90% of the Swiss population are not showing up at the voting office. But they fill out the ba ballots at home and post them in the mail and hope they end up in New York. Of course, without a real guarantee. Uh, and all the security problems around it, they're kind of accepted. Voting coercion, husbands gunpoint their wives to vote, that's accepted in Switzerland. I don't know if it happens. Sometimes it's hit in the news. People collecting paper ballots from the waste paper collection, that's kind of accepted in the political discourse in Switzerland. However, it is a real security problem. And when you've established uh, voting by mail, then electronic voting is not so far off anymore because you receive the security codes in the mail. And instead of sending it back, you fill it out in the browser. So from a process point of view for the voter, it's fairly close. That makes it much more uh, viable in that setup. What other reasons are there? Uh, foreign voters are a huge group of, of voters in Switzerland. We have like 10, 15% of our population is spread across the globe. And mail is not working as nicely as it does in, let's say, in US or Switzerland. We are very proud of Swiss Post. So they do a very good job. This works. But when you go to South America and you get a paper ballot from Switzerland, the voting is already over. <laughs> so they're really lobbying for online voting. We want this. They would still get the letter, but then maybe still have a day. How is Mexico? Terrible. Terrible. 
Would you get to vote ever or? No. Because it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the return path would be cut away, so at least half of the problem would be solved by online voting. That's why they're voting for that. What other reasons do we have? Handicapped voters. Obviously, visually impaired people don't have voting secrecy. They need to trust somebody to fill out the ballot for them. Uh, it's probably worse uh, voting by mail. There are no voting machines in Switzerland. These are really, we're not having them. You do it by hand or we're in a pilot stage uh, electronic voting. With a, a screen reader, a blind person could do online voting and retain voting secrecy. And actually waiting for organizations by handicapped people to sue government for voting secrecy because they're not having it. They have, depending on the legislation, they have to trust a voting official to fill the ballot for them. Imagine that. <laughs> so they're a group that really want online voting. We have lots of invalid ballots. And of course, uh, a lot of these referendums, they end up like 49% against 51. And we have typically 5% invalid ballots. So it's kind of decisive. The political discourse say, yeah, it affects everybody. So it levels out. But I wonder if that is the case, <laughs> if it really hits all the parties uh, at the same time. And with a. Uh, with elections, it's even worse. They go up to 10, 20% invalid ballots because the ballots are so complicated in Switzerland. You're allowed to do crazy stuff with uh, election ballots in Switzerland. And then, uh, because of voting secrecy, nobody tells you that this is invalid now. Uh, hi, welcome to my talk. Uh, and finally, and that is a bit ironic, uh, online voting is such a stupid idea. But in light of the digital processes around physical voting, like voting registers in Excel sheets attached to non-encrypted emails sent to the printing press, uh, the tallying process because of the complicated uh, election ballots done on black box computers, often online on black box servers without minimal security standards established, checked, executed, anything. So suddenly online voting becomes surprisingly attractive in that context. Personally, I haven't really made up my mind if it's worth the danger, if the pros and the cons weak out, and if online voting is a good idea in the end. I think that is a political decision. We're probably going to have a referendum on that. I hope we do. Uh, it's not quite clear. And if I'm going to vote yes or no, I don't know. But I guess, or I hope I have you in the boat, if somebody's really doing this, then you better have the most secure voting system in existence. It better be transparent and secure. Uh, and this is how I got to the project. Early on in the project, they decided they need an, a web application firewall, and they want to have an open source web application firewall that is capable of doing high security setup. That's how I got involved into the project. And I've set up that part of the project. I have very little knowledge of the mathematical cryptography running inside the central system, the encryption of the ballot, the mixing, the anonymization, to retain voting secrecy, that's all high math, and I don't have insight into that. I'm just protecting the system from the front, the first line of protection, so to say. So the web application firewall. There are a lot of web application firewalls in the world. There are dozens of commercial products around. They're often a bit daunting. They're super complex. They're overwhelming and they're very often not very functional. Most WAFs on the globe are in monitoring mode if they're switched on at all. Because PCI says you're going to have one, you need one, but PCI doesn't say you need to switch it on, actually. <laughs> and I think people found that loophole. <laughs> Good. Uh, there is, however, only a single open source offering in, in place, a general purpose open source web application firewall, and that is mod security. All the other ones are commercial ones, However, a lot of the commercials are actually based on mod security. I would gauge a, a third of the commercial ones have mod security under the hood. And then an additional third are probably having a custom implementation in order to run CRS. I'm getting back to that. So what is mod security? Mod security is a module running in your web server. It is traditionally used together with Apache. It also runs with Nginx. More and more people are running it in Nginx. I'm still recommending Apache because Apache is more flexible and it's easier to work with. But my business case is keeping people running when they opted for Nginx. I enjoy doing that. I'm going to earn more money if you run Nginx 
than if you run Apache because it's easier for you. Um, it is embedded into the web server. It is rule oriented and is very transparent about the rules. It has very good logging, very detailed logging, and you know in a deterministic way exactly what is happening inside. So um, this is no artificial intelligence, self-learning, cloud-enabled security monster. No, this is a dead, honest engineering product, more like a Swiss watch. That's exactly what you in, in, instructed it to do. And if you don't like it, you switch off one of the rules. It's very simple to do. So you know exactly what is happening there. And this makes it especially suited for a high security setup that is supposed to be transparent, open for public scrutiny. People want to know what security is running in their online voting system. That's how this came to be. Good. So mod security is the engine. Then, of course, functionality comes with the rules on top. People often talk of mod security, but what they mean is the rules on top. Mod security is just the engine. It's the web server that nobody talks about, but the name is so well established. The standard rules that people are using is CRF3. So that's the mod security rule set version 3 from OWASP. It's an OWASP flagship project, has been around for more than 10 years within the OWASP family. And we have like 10, 12 very active developers. It's a very fun project and we're growing like mad. Major cloud providers, CDNs are supporting CRS now out of the box. AWS announced in November you can have Tickbox CRS. Verizon is using um, CRS, Azure has been supporting it. Cloudflare is based on CRS. They've expanded since. Akamai has probably forked the rules that they're not so transparent about that. I know that Oracle is using it without ever dropping a single term of what they're actually doing. But they have a legacy, a legacy CRS on mod security running. I know because I explained it to their, to their developers, what they have, what they're implemented, and how to use this. So CRS 3. Uh, this is uh, a graph I did uh, with a friend of mine. This is burp attacking a vulnerable application. And the first column on the left, you see four and a half million burp requests attacking a vulnerable application. The application has holes in it, and you want to see if the security scanner can detect them all. Burp discovered like 40 weaknesses in the application. Uh, across over a thousand requests within four million requests. That's a really strong pumped up burp run by a specialist. That. Then in the second column, you get a default installation with CRS3. So that's the five minute default installation. 80% of the problem is gone. SQL injection has disappeared. I'm not claiming that SQL injection is solved, not at all. All I'm saying is, a default CRS installation is so strong that Burp is no longer able to pull off an SQL injection. The attacker is still able to do it. He just has to do it on his own, no longer assisted by a security scanner. The, 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 the results are pretty the same if you, if you use SQL map, which is quite advanced in, in this domain. So this is really strong. We have a bit more problems with cross-site scripting because cross-site scripting is harder to protect against because of the mix of data and, and information. Uh, and, t and content. Uh, what are the other columns here? This is default installation at paranoia level one. Paranoia levels are a way to me measure or describe the aggressiveness of the rule set for us. PL1 is the default installation. These are well tested, nice rules with a good behavior that make a fairly clean cut between the benign users on the one side and the attackers on the other side. The cut is pretty clean with these rules. They're well tested and we know they're good. That's why they're in default installation. Things get a bit more blurry in higher paranoia levels. There the rules are more aggressive. In the default installation, you have about 150 rules. So that's a standard rule base. And then as you advance, you get up to 200 rules. But they are now no longer as clear cut. They're super aggressive. It is a bit like a mad dog in your house. So a nice dog knows your friends, and he's very friendly to the family. If you have a mad dog, one of the side effects is it might bite one of your guests sooner or later. 
That's one of the side effects of having a really mad dog. That's a paranoia level four dog. The mailman delivering a post package to your door could be bitten by the mad dog. That is a false positive. And that is something you need to handle. You need to treat this. You need to think of that. You need resources to train the dog. The dog responds well to training. Mod security and CRS respond to training. But you need to do this. It is a process. And then eventually, you end up with a well-trained dog that knows the mailman delivering the post package and no carnage happening unless the postman tries out the back door to your house. And this will be bloodshed, <laughs> especially in paranoia level four. Do you get the, con do you get the concept here? So the, the more aggressive on the right, but the harder it becomes for an attacker, of course. And you, together with, or if you're a security officer, together with developers, project leaders, you decide how big is our security appetite. Is this a high security situation? Or is it just a standard online shop for, for whatever, with no real money involved? Then we're probably not investing in a mad dog. Then we just take out of the box standard installation. That's good enough. It's solving 80% of the problem, and we don't have time for the rest. And we concentrate on that. And that's still way better than the competition across the street, because they're not using this. Good. We go on. So what is it, then, a high security setup? I haven't really found a clear cut definition, so kind of made up my own. I think a high security setup is a setup where you're willing and able to invest a lot of time developing and refining your configuration to optimize it for security. I think it boils down to a time investment. You can buy products, tons of shiny boxes, but in the end, you need to integrate them, and this takes time. And um, if you are having the time, if you're giving the time to do it, then you can approach a high security setup. Otherwise, it's probably a should be high security setup. Good. So what else do you need? You need an, a good base. I'm including this slide. This is information I'm interested in when I'm running high security, mod security setups. This is all information that Apache is giving you. Nginx is giving you about a third. So with the rest of the information you need to improvise on Nginx, I'm here to help you if you want to. <laughs> but Apache can give you this out of the box. I'm covering this topic down here at this URL. Uh, I'm, as we speak, I'm tweeting uh, these links. So if you follow me on Twitter, you get the links automatically. The tutorials uh, are kind of the de facto standard tutorials on mod security and CRS. They're all public. This is explained there how you do this and how to make use of this information in a useful way, um, being in the common line or in your log application in your Elk stack. Ever remember it's an Elk stack, not a Moose stack? <laughs> There's a reason for that. Good. So logging is key. Logging is really important. Uh, in here, you need to have this right, and then you put the application firewall on top. CRS is an anomaly scoring rule set. Now, most VAFs, they're black and white. You're either good or an alarm goes off, you're an attacker, you're going to be blocked. This means during the integration process, you need to be in monitoring mode. Because lacking good real life test traffic, you need to tune the rule set in production, but you cannot do blocking mode until you're really sure the mad dog has been trained. So you enter this into monitoring mode, if you switch, switch on the buff at all. And, and then on the day where you solved all the false positives, you're going to switch to blocking mode, unless, of course, the day never comes. People are staying in monitoring mode forever because there's still false positives, and there is no real pressure to get rid of the false positive because it's monitoring mode. Who cares? And that's why a lot of the VAF setups are really non-functional. Good. With animal scoring, this is different. From day one, you can enter blocking mode. And I really counsel people, you start in blocking mode. You just put the limbo threshold very, very high. And this never blocks. It's just extremely high. And then you lower it down. As you train your dog, you tune away the false positives 
the tutorials are describing this process in lots of exercises that you can do at home with real life traffic. How to tune this? Well explained in the tutorials. You tune it down over several iterations until you end again in a black and white setup uh, where a single alert is going to block. However, the way to get there is much more smooth because you start up in blocking mode, very high anomaly limit. You lower it from, let's say, 10,000 is a good entry point, I think. You, you lower it down to 100, and nothing bad happens. And this enforces confidence in the, se in the setup. Yeah, nothing bad happened. We can go to, from 100 to 50. Based on the logging, we know nothing bad is going to happen because nothing ever scored as high as 50 after initial training. And then you go down to 20, to 10, to 5, and this is like the goal you want to have. This is taking time. Um, this can actually take a lot of time. In, in the online voting setup I described, lacking traffic because it's pilot project state, couple of thousand voters every couple of months using the application. We took like two years to have enough traffic to really have confidence in the tuning process and to lower the limit down to five. And then we knew these are no longer false positives. It's a well-tuned system now. This is what you ultimately want to go. Good. You want to tune down to zero, and then you have this new confidence that every alert that you're seeing is actually an attacker. And if you're in the WAF domain, that is a completely new experience. The standard WAF experience is, oh, I have an alert. Is this a benign user? Oh, did we just block him? Oh, shit. Or uh, is, it could be an attack. It looks a wee bit as an attack. Or not. And you can spend literally hours finding out, unless you really know the application, if this is happening. This looks really bad, but it's also a known bad application with legacy code. You're not really sure. But if you have tuned it down and you have this reassurance, then you know, hey, whatever shows up, it's an attack. And this is so liberating in your mind because, hey, this is an attacker in front of my eyes, and I don't have to think twice anymore. I can kill it, this request, immediately, and no customer is going to be angry with me ringing my CEO who then slaps down on me. Not going to happen because I know this is an attacker. And this is very rare in the WAF world. It's much more clear cut for a standard network firewall when you know this port is not open. If you use the port, then you're going to be blocked. In the web application firewall world, you're never quite sure it might be. It, it's an SQL injection in a cookie, but maybe they saved the search string in a cookie. I've actually seen this. So it looks really bad as an attack, but maybe it's just standard behavior. When you've tuned down to zero false positives, then you can trust your alerts, and it's a very liberating moment. And then, of course, you can divide and rule, because then you can be really nasty. You can say, hey, look, you just you sent an attack. I no longer talking to you. I got to ban your IP address. I'm using fail to ban now, standard Unix tool. It's a bit of a beast, but if you can it correctly, Burp is doing a single request to your application and it's off. You're no longer talking to us. And the security researcher, the pen tester, first time bumping into this, or the attacker, will, they will think, have I just killed the application? Because they're not used to being blacklisted after an SQL injection. But when you have confidence in your logs, in your alerts, then you just blacklist and go away. This doesn't mean then advanced persistent attackers are no longer able to attack you. Of course, they can rotate the IP addresses. They know how to do this. However, all the shit filling your dashboard is gone because you no longer have 20,000 alerts per day. You have like 10 alerts per day, and you know they have been blacklisted. They're not a real problem. They have been blocked anyway. And then you can concentrate on the advanced attackers that are worth your time investment. So high security setup, very aggressive rule set, well-tuned, high confidence in the setup brings you to a situation where you can really divide good and bad and be really nasty with the attackers. What else uh, do we need? What else can you do? Uh, whitelisting. So CRS is a generic blacklisting rule set. And it knows about the bad stuff but doesn't really know so much about the good stuff. Uh, whitelisting, as in a network firewall, you just deny everything, and then you open up certain requests. 
you open API endpoints, you open HTTP methods connecting to certain API endpoints, you open content types in post requests, you open up parameter names and parameter values. Say you have a registration form with a birth date, why would you accept letters on a birth, on a year of birth? That's four digits. And it's pretty hard to pull off an attack in four digits. So when you're able to do whitelisting, wow, that's so strong. Because now the attacker has to fit into that hole to get into your castle, to get into your crown jewels. And that's so hard. And the two complementing each other, the generic blacklisting and the whitelisting stacked in several behind each other are giving a very, very strong setup. Why the two combined? As it happens, for structured input, whitelisting is extremely strong. When you have a modern web application built with a framework and in a very standard way, you have maybe a swagger export of your API, then it's fairly simple to do a rule set like this. This is a whitelisting example of a login application. Uh, you can machine generate this. That is easy. Back in the day when developers would write their own code by hand, that would be hard. But nowadays, it's getting simpler and simpler. So whitelisting setups become viable. They used to be way too expensive. Uh, however, it's becoming easier. And in, in a high security setup, costs are playing less of a role. You have the resources, basically. Or you can pitch for the resources. Look, we need to have a whitelisting setup on top. And you're probably getting this in a high security setup. Because money is often a bit less of a constraint than in a standard setup. So complementing each other, for structured input, whitelisting works very well. For free text input, it doesn't work so well. Because you kind of have to accept anything in a free form text field. And you have uh, sysadmins talking amongst each other about SQL queries in an online wiki. Securing that wiki with whitelisting is really hard. Because you back basically to post content, accept anything as whitelist. Uh, there, the blacklisting approach of CRS is a bit better because it's triggered by keywords. And it would go, hey, this smells of SQL injection. I don't know an, an exploit, but I know this smells of SQL, and we're not allowing this. So the two are really complementing each other. Uh, this is a bit hard to read. I did a bit of syntax highlighting. However, you get used to it. I mean, I read these rules like the newspapers. Uh, I admit I've been doing this for 10, 15 years. But you can get the hang of it, kind of, don't you? I mean, here are the three field names. Why I'm using this example, uh, people would often say, hey, wait, hold on. Whitelisting is too hard. You can do this on network level. Hey, but the application, our application, we do sprints. We do releases every two weeks. You're out of your mind doing, uh, proposing a whitelisting setup here. And say, yeah, I understand. I feel you. But did you ever think about a partial whitelist? Because often you, ha you work with authenticated users. You kind of have a bit of a accountability. And the, complex, the complexity of your application is hidden behind the login. So what you're really exposing on the internet to all the attackers around the globe is the login form. And you're not telling me that the login form is being sprinted on every two weeks. That is a very stable part of your application. And it only has two or three fields. It's a username, password, and a security token that is hidden. And you can really whitelist this fairly easily. These are all the parameters of a standard login application. It, it's, it fits half a, half a single page. And then you're ready, well covered. Plus maybe three API endpoints, the, the display login, the do the login, and do the logout. That's like the standard login API endpoints. And that's it. That's really doable. And this cuts off 90% of the attackers easily with a super strict whitelisting setup. So people shy away from whitelists. But I think it is worth considering because often uh, protecting the login and the registration does 90% of the job. And the rest of the application can be as dynamic, as sprinty, and scrummy as it, as it has to be. You don't really care. Good. Uh, what else to say about whitelisting? Uh, I talked about this as well. Yeah, the effect is just that the attack surface going here makes it very obvious the attacker is now facing a wall with very little holes in it. And you're effectively imposing rules on the attacker 
It's no longer the attacker uh, defining the game here. You're defining the rules, and the attacker has to jump through the hoops and fit his attack into these arrow slits here, making it very hard for an attacker. Uh, in the online setup, online voting setup we used, this proved the most effective. The two combined uh, did the job, but it was the whitelisting setup that, that killed uh, most of the attacks, and it also frustrated the attackers. With the attackers we talked about, they were, yeah, you, you, you try to guess API endpoints, and nothing works outside of the handful of endpoints that are known and published. Good. What are additional rules that we're considering? I haven't done this. The online voting setup I'm talking about has not implemented this, but I think they're worth considering, worth looking into it. You can monitor the flow of the application. Uh, if you've been in the talk by Kavya Perlman yesterday, she explained how they're learning the behavior of the application with the machine learning. I think modern WAFs, next, next generation, WAF, third generation WAFs with machine learning, they're pretty good at that. And they have an advantage there. This is fairly tricky to do in mod security. I wish I would have a customer ask me to do this in mod security. I know how I would be doing it, but I haven't done it. I haven't pulled this off, monitored the flow of the application. And then, of course, if somebody posts something because it, before it has, it, uh, the page has been requested, then you know you flag this for alert. That's not the standard behavior. The timing and the rhythm of a user is fairly obvious. A security scanner is a far different rhythm of sending his requests. Uh, a screen scraping application has a different rhythm than a standard browser. And then, of course, client fingerprinting. Everybody uh, says in the user, I'm a Mozilla browser these days. But of course, a lot of the agents are not. And if it doesn't behave as a Mozilla, then you no longer trust the user agent. So um, that would work pretty nicely, I'm sure, as well. But I haven't done this myself. Beyond the web application firewall, uh, you want to have application layer DDoS, slow lorries attacks, for example, and the like. Quality of service, you want to have defense against screen scraping, brute forcing, all that stuff. Honestly, mod security is not in a good position to help you there. There are a couple of rule sets. Even a CRS is one or two rule sets. But no. You need better tools to do this, uh, but, and they're around. Uh, GOIP is probably less of an issue or less of a value proposal in the United States when you own, you guys own half of the IP addresses around the globe. Compare this to Switzerland. At the Swiss IP range is fit into a firewall ACL. <laughs> and uh, GOIP is really effective. We're under attack. We switch off all the foreigners because it's a local application. And that is so effective because then the attackers go away, because they're no longer effective. And if we have a Swiss attacker, we ring, home his, ring up his mommy. Be, beca <laughs> be, because there are like 40 ISPs in Switzerland. Who is the IP address? Is out oh, Swisscom. I know the guys. Could you switch off this guy? He's attacking us. So that's standard procedure. You don't have to be afraid of them anymore. Uh, and lots of countries in Europe do this. Uh, under attack, GOIP, attack goes away, open up again. And we live with the foreigners not able to connect to us for half an hour or so. Uh, there are lots of IP reputation providers around the globe. Make use of them. This is really useful. And mod security integrates into that. Good. So summing this up, what are the key elements of high security buff? You want to have CRS at paranoia level 4. Tune it down to zero, a well-tuned web setup. You want a complementary whitelisting rule set possibly around the complete application. It depends on the complexity of the application, but at least do a partial whitelist for the parts of the application where this is viable. You want application level DDoS, defense, QS, et cetera, GOIP, IP reputation. Good. So coming back to the online voting project, uh, how many people in the room are familiar with the Swiss online voting? You probably are. There, you remember the headlines. <laughs> OK. For the rest of you, uh, we, we made the headlines with this. Or uh, my customer made the headlines with this. The Swiss online voting has been in development for many years. 
There are several systems around, but only one have persisted, the one of my customers, Swiss Post Online Voting, joint venture with the Spanish uh, company Cytel. So Cytels are the voting experts. They do the core system. They know about the cryptography. Uh, Swiss Post is the system provider. They know about running systems. Two made a joint venture. Actually, I think it's a very good match, I have to admit. That really works nicely, at least on paper. Uh, and then in 2019, so for 15 years, Switzerland has done pilot level online voting. And in 2019, Swiss Post would seek 100% certification. This means when you have passed that certification, you are allowed to roll out your system across the country to 100% of the constituents. Uh, then, I mean, local voting districts would need to buy this first, but at least you would allowed, uh, you'd be allowed by law to do this. So uh, Nobody's been allowed to do this so far in Switzerland, uh, but it's, um, the regulation is there. The regulation is fairly strict, as we supposed to jump through all the hoops, uh, until the two final hoops. Hope number one, very small in the regulations. Before you go to 100%, you need to publish your source code. So the Spanish commercial company Cytel was forced to publish their source code. A Swiss Post was forced to publish the Spanish source code, and Spaniards had kind of agreed to that. They didn't like it, but that's the regulation. If you want to do business here at 100%, you need to publish the source code. And um, they did this. Of course, they held back to the very last moment. I mean, they had 10 years to do this, and they held back to the very last moment. Second hope to jump through a public intrusion test. Put this up for a test. Have attackers, uh, attackers basically a four-week bug bounty program into the system we had built over the course of several years. And unfortunately, the source code program, they waited very, very long. And then the project was delayed. The source code project ran was delayed. And in the end, the two things happened virtually at the same moment. Like uh, one or two weeks, the source code program had an advance notice one or two weeks when they published the source code. Once it hit the media, the two programs were up. And uh, first, how did my project, the public intrusion test, go? Uh, so they wanted to do this seriously. Uh, if you want to have public scrutiny, bug bounty program on your own land voting scene, what do you do? You go to DEF CON eVoting Village, obviously. They recruited people at the eVoting Village in Las Vegas, and they got 3,000 people registered for the bug bounty program. Uh, and then they threw them in the arena and my WAF set up on the other side. It basically boils down to that. Me and my team, our WAF in the first line of attack and DEF CON on the other side of the playing field, and they attacked us. In the end, we had 950 attackers over the course of four weeks attacking the system. Uh, they've thrown all sorts of things against us, and we had all sorts of lock and insight into what they were actually doing, and uh, they had us switch off the fail to ban. Government had us switch off the fail to ban. Said, if you're keeping up the fail to ban, attackers will be so extremely pissed we're getting bad press over this. And we kind of like, yeah, we understand it, but it's really painful to switch off the coolest part of the setup. But it's understandable if you want them to test your system, then you're not killing your IP address after the first SQL injection. So we couldn't pull this off. Uh, but still, uh, they did this, and then we got the results. How does this look like? We had four weeks. We had a bounty. The highest bounty was 50,000 Swiss francs. That's 50,000 US dollars. We have currency parency here. Highest category, undetectable vote manipulation. This is stealing the, the vote with the mathematical proofs, the verification process, not noticing it. 50,000 bucks. Wasn't claimed. Detectable vote manipulation? Wasn't claimed. Breaking vote secrecy on the server side? Wasn't claimed. Zero findings. Destruction of votes? Didn't happen. Intrusion into the system? Now we're getting standard. <laughs> Web application security? Didn't happen. 16 findings we ate. So you could say we've been really lucky, or maybe have been really good. We ate but 16 findings. Uh, they're all in the best practice section, low or info level. I'm giving you two examples. The first one is an embarrassing one. Uh, Swiss researchers were able to inject an arbitrary IP address in an application log. 
and that was my fault. That, whoops. That, that was really embarrassing. I should have called that. Uh, uh, but that's the worst that happened. Arbitrary IP address in a not very important application log. Uh, and the second finding, just to give you an idea of the additional findings, we, in certain error pages, we would return the X-frame options headers twice, which isn't it conforming with the RFC or the standard. It, there isn't even RFC for X-frame options, but whatever, it's not the standard. We paid out 100 Swiss francs. OK, <laughs> thank you for reporting. But if, that's the, if that is our problem, we kind of accept that. So these are the 16 findings. And you could say, we've been doing pretty good. And fortunately, the source code program happened in parallel. And it's not a surprise that the public and the media and politicians had the two programs messed up with one another. This is when Seidel hit the online research community. This is what happened. Researchers find critical backdoor in Swiss online voting. Ouch. Backdoor doesn't sound very good. Uh, Swiss Post puts e-voting on hold after researchers uncover critical security errors. Swiss electronic voting system is like, well, the pun was coming, Swiss cheese. Yeah. So uh, researchers, namely around Sarah Jamie Lewis, Vanessa Teague, uh, uh, Pereira in, in Belgium, several Swiss researchers, they discovered highly critical cryptographic implementation errors in the source code. And the result, what Sarah Lewis would say is that source code is like a bridge built in cotton candy, <laughs> putting up for public scrutiny. This has been developed as closed source for 15 years, and then it put it out on the internet, and it happened exactly as you would expect, actually worse than I expected, and I expected the worst. It was so bad, they had to stop the whole program, and it's now on hold, and it's going to be back probably at the end of the year, maybe next year, maybe not at all if we're going to hold a public vote, if it's ever coming back. So the, the source code was ripped apart within days. None of these critical findings has been pulled off against the WAF. Maybe nobody tried. I think the third finding, the, the, nail, the final nail in the coffin that really stopped the system, that is one which might have been past the, the rule set. Uh, the first ones would have been caught. Uh, you would have supported within the organization to pull this off. That was out of scope. Uh, so the system was stopped by Swiss Post, uh, or it would have been stopped by the government. The certification is reworked now. You can be assured that public scrutiny, publication of source code, is going to play a bigger role in the, flute, in the future. Not a single sentence in the certification manual anymore. It's going to be very important, I reckon, in the future. And then we'll see if Swiss Post is back with their system. Uh, I finished my job there because, yeah, seems the WAF setup is done. We fixed the X-frame options uh, header and uh, the IP address injection. And now the source code guys are working. And Seidel is working like mad. Uh, they say they are overhauling the company. They're recreating their whole source code creation process. The quality assurance is re done from scratch because they really understood it. And this wasn't good. It's going to be a new thing when they come back next year. However. Uh, two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, they published a paper or a poster, achievements of Seidel in 2019, and they would say, Switzerland, Transparency Initiative, source code opened to 3,000 hackers, zero penetrations. Yeah, but that's not your, that's not your fame, guys. This has been the WAF that stopped the attackers from ever hitting your application. And I'm a wee bit pissed at Seidel for publishing that and stealing the fame of an open source project. Uh, that's a bit thick, guys. Yeah, uh, whatever. We'll see how this goes on. So far, Swiss, uh, Swiss Post has taken this with the resilience of a tank. They just continue. They had to stop it, but they're working on it, and they promise to be back at the end of the year. So if this is really coming, we'll see. Uh, I get the feeling, uh, actually, Swiss voters want this. There is huge media pressure, politicians pressure against, but administration and the voters are open for it because it's convenient, it's cool, it's modern, it's digital. They want to have this. So we'll see. Uh, resources, I've been tweeting about this. Uh, you have all the links in the tweets. 
uh, the tutorials here on top. Again, quickly, I'm training mod security uh, and CRS, namely in-house and public courses. The most important articles are here. These are the official reports about the public intrusion test with all the data I've presented. This hasn't been a, a disclosure. Everything I told you today has been published before. Otherwise, I wouldn't be allowed to speak about that system, obviously. And uh, this is how you find me. Uh, feedback and questions are welcome. I have Swiss chocolate here for me. So whoever <laughs> does a question gets a Swiss chocolate. <laughs> Yay. Alex, wide for the mic. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned there's a third bypass or third finding that may have bypassed the WEF. Uh, yeah, so they had three critical findings in the source code. Uh, Sarah Jamie Lewis would, would conclude every single zero knowledge proof has been flawed in that cryptography. They, they kind of fucked up with every single one of them. It's a huge code base, historically lots of legacy code. Uh, they found the function defined 16 times. They found a ton of dead code not being used. What, what kind of what you would expect in legacy source mm. code? And three findings. And the third finding was, uh, we have a bit of time. I can explain to you how this works. You do the, the online voting. You fill out. You vote, and then you get a return code, a personal return code, which you look up on paper. I voted yes. I get a four-digit code. Is it confirming to what I have on paper? If it is, then you know you have a guarantee, you have a verification that your vote has been recorded in the urn. This is how this works. And the flaw was they were able to manipulate the vote via a man in the browser to make it re get the right return code, but during the tallying, the vote would be dropped because it was invalid. Extremely cool and extremely illegal, and this is killing the system. <laughs> I mean, the system is built on this verification process. I mean, and this is called the individual verifiability, but individual voter can check my vote it has been recorded the way I intended it. And I have checked this. And if this guarantee is broken, then the system is broken. And the pilot having gone on for three or five years <clears throat> might have been exploited without notice. So they had to stop the system after this. And the first and the second findings, uh, they were rather internal, so they were not as grave. And this one, the way the vote is encrypted, the WAF is not able to see the vote. This has to do with voting secrecy. So it's an it's a, uh, encrypted channel and an encrypted ballot in the encrypted channel. So if you have a manipulated vote in the encrypt, encrypted in an encrypted channel, the WAF wouldn't see it anymore. So I think they might be able to pull this off, likely to be able to pull this off. But the finding came extremely late in the, in the bug bounty program, like two days before the end. And these researchers didn't try to do this themselves. They just demonstrated in the source code, and that settled. And nobody picked it up within two days to pull it off on the live system. But uh, that would have been even more devastating. And I think that finding would have been possible despite the WAF, because that really works with the cryptography. Uh, the rest, the attacks, the standard system attacks, what you would expect in a bug bounty program, security research, this was all dodged by the, by the WAF, because of whitelisting. Yeah. Answer the question? Yeah. <clears throat> So Christian, I had a question for you. Traditionally, you know, I've been working with various different flavors of next-gen firewalls, uh, whatever you want to call oh, them, yeah. WAFs, uh, <laughs> for probably about 12 years. And one of the things that, are, that has always been a little annoying to me is the options of either allow and deny, right? Yeah. Where, you know, we're seeing more and more systems getting into, you know, you talked about behavior, right? Looking mm -hmm. at the behavior of the application, but also the ability, where do you see mod security or what is your personal opinion on not just allow and deny, but potentially serving alternate content, uh, doing uh, various different 307s, 302s to tar pits, honey pits, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not just a hard 403 or 404, but actually doing something other than just allow and deny. OK. Uh, mod security is flexible enough to 
build this on top of the engine. You just have to do it. And I don't know of setups who've really done this. Uh, you, you, do, you guys do this. All, like risk-based or like you... Response, whatever, yeah. So, so you can basically do this. The rule language allows for that. It's there. You have to do this. The setups I work on, they're more black and white. When we have made up our mind about you, then we block you. However, uh, what you can, for example, fairly easily also do with mod security is you do uh, different anomaly thresholds for different users. You would say, okay, this is looking suspicious now. I'm taking a far lower limit now. I'm not accepting this anymore, while I would accept it for an authenticated user. Stuff like that is fairly easy. Uh, what you talk about could be more complicated, but the engine basically allows for it. You just have to do it. Programmatically, we can pretty much do anything. Yeah, it's just yeah. the framework hasn't been established within you could this say like project. That. I could yeah. start that project yeah. and, and, and you could and start this on GitHub immediately, and people would be very open to try this out. Fantastic. <laughs> good. Any other questions? I have more chocolate. <laughs> Nancy, good. <laughs> I've seen on your team, Francisca Bueller has been introducing CRS within the CI/CD pipeline. Can you yes. talk a little bit about this? Okay, yeah, I could. So what what uh, uh, what traditional WAF vendors uh, didn't grasp is to move to the cloud. Uh, traditional ones they would develop their hardware boxes for many years, and then and this opened up new opportunities for mod security because it's so flexible. Put in a container, easy. Uh, put in your dev uh, dev. Uh, development pipeline easily. So they would develop their application and the WAF is right there. As part of the unit tests, they would run the WAF. They could do a SAP proxy attack against the, the code and via the WAF immediately as part of the sign off of the code before you merge it. This has been done and uh, well documented by Francisca. Uh, uh, this is a uh, in several blog posts. If you go to the uh, CoralSat um, website, uh, the newsletter we're publishing there in the blog has links to all this stuff, her blog posts. We, uh, she also did one or two blog posts on our website where she explains the setup. And whenever you check in code, uh, all the unit tests are executed via the WAF. And, and if the results with the WAF is different from without the WAF, then we have a coding problem here. And we're not merging this. We're not rolling this to production. And this gives a high level of reassurance for the developer. Because standard behavior is, of course, I'm a developer. I have new code. Wow, tomorrow is the big day. We're rolling out a new feature. And then the buff kills the day. <laughs> the, the experience for developers is extremely bad. However, with a, Vav in CI/CD pipeline, he notices this problem when he commits his code and says, oh, oops, oh, this parameter triggered a rule. Maybe uh, I can talk to the guy switching off that parameter inspection, or how oh, oh, I change the behavior in my code, because apparently this looks suspicious. Maybe uh, select, select Bobby Tables is not such a good parameter names. <laughs> Let's use something different. Stuff like that. So uh, what you're getting out of this is immediate feedback. And this is highly welcome in a DevOps setup. So this is really useful. And she has investigated. I think she's on the forefront of doing this. And she has done this for a Swiss bank. The setup is actually documented. It, it's, a, it's a German newspaper article describing the setup. Uh, but the principle is the same as in her uh, English articles where she developed this. Thank you. Uh, Give me chocolate. <laughs>